What happens when two bass road warriors spend quality time talking music and life with one of their peers? Bassist educator author David C. Gross and bassist and head honcho of KnowYourBassPlayer.com, Tom Semioli, trade eights with the legends of rock, jazz, funk, blues, folk, country, and more. Notes from an artist. Revealing conversations with the legends who've created the soundtrack of our lives. What happens? You're about to find out. It's another episode of Notes from an Artist. Welcome back, our listener, and welcome back to a part two interview with Cisco Bradley and Linus Caraggio. Did I say that right, David? Did I pronounce that? Uh, right? Listen, you're the Italian in the group, so I'm the Italian. Welcome to the Henny Youngman Show. The book that Cisco Bradley wrote, it is the Williamsburg Avant-Garde Experimental Music and Sound on the Brooklyn Waterfront. It is available now on Duke University Press in digital and hard copy form. And man, this book is just so chock full of information, insights. As we said, Cisco had his boots on the ground. He was there in Brooklyn. And so he gives us a kind of a first person recollection of what happened. And of course, he, he wanted to interview like 150 people. 180 people. I, I mean, the thing is really so well researched that it's a fascinating read. And if you read the previous book, which I think I sent you, the William Parker book, yes, which he right also it. wrote, his style of writing, it's easy to read. Yes, it is very conversational. So you really get through the book. And it's a book you can also read in sections. You can go back and forth the different periods of time. Uh, interest you. And of course, he goes into the social, the economic and political climate, which created Williamsburg. And as we ask the question, can there be another scene like this? I don't know. I think there'll be more micro scenes. I don't think there'll be a big scene like Brooklyn anymore, but I could be wrong. There are a few things we were talking about at the beginning of the uh, first part of the interview in our introduction, the fact that you and I started out with no cell phones. We now embrace cell phones. But here's the interesting thing. When COVID was going on, the only way to watch music live was through streaming. We were thinking, oh my God, this is going to be great. What another platform. But now, post-COVID, I don't see that really happening again. Yeah, that's right. We thought that was going to happen while everybody's back up and about. So people are actually going out again. So yes, maybe they won't depend so much on streaming. But streaming is it's here to stay when it comes to music and and programming. Look at me. I was just, uh, you know, I just cut the cord on cable television. You did that a long time ago. So I think also something about our generation that we use technology. We don't let technology use us. And with age comes some wisdom. One thing that I'm curious about is our platform of doing this on Zoom. At a certain point, that has to improve, whether it's Zoom doing the improvement or someone else. You would liken streaming to the same thing. Because look, we have small speakers. My monitor is 27 inches, which is virtually more than double what a normal laptop is. There are a lot of intangibles that some smart engineer and software person could really up the game, making it a good way to communicate. So when the Mad Max world continues the way that it's going, Where we'll this? probably need this kind of streaming and zooming so that we who are the fringe of the fringe will be able to mobilize. Look, Zoom technology has certainly improved since we started using it two years ago. I'm sure in the big corporate world where they have much higher connectivity and their own servers, I'm sure the Zoom quality or B2B quality in video communications is far superior than what we have. We're just using the same consumer platform that everyone right. else is. And of course, we have awful connectivity here. You see the difference in New York and Connecticut. You can't get me on the subway, and sometimes I can't get you when you go to Starbucks. But another thing that I find interesting about this new world, so to speak, is the fact that one of the only forms of music that you could trace back to the beginning and really hear it recorded from the beginning is jazz. With the benefits of the Spotify's and the YouTube's, a lot of this music, particularly the avant-garde, which is not available everywhere and hadn't been available post when they recorded the damn thing and put it out whatever year they did. Now, the book comes alive, and a lot of books like this do come alive because you can now, oh, I'm going to listen to this here. An early William Parker record, an early uh, Albert Eiler record, things that were just done live. I mean, this is a boom, the study of the music, and I, I I think it's great. It is. It really is. And and as you and I railed and Cisco did about the Wintonization of jazz and, of course, Ken Burns' woefully incomplete documentary, uh, we need books like this because this is important stuff. 
And it's bad enough that Burns and a lot of other historians have sort of ignored the 60s and 70s and the avant-garde jazz fusion and even world music to a degree. Uh, we need books like Cisco Bradley's book. And let's talk about another guest we have. And I don't think in the first episode he he talked very much, but uh, Linus Caraggio came alive in the second part of this. And again, Linus was a guy who was there. He he curated shows. He ran clubs. It's great to talk to these veterans who were on the ground when the bullets were flying and, and why the scene succeeded and why it collapsed and what caused it. And also, he's still making art. Yesterday, I was in the Lower East Side I'm um, going to an art show. Yes, you and are. And on the way after that, Linus, Nancy, and I went to KGB for a drink. And right on the corner of Fourth Street and Second Avenue is a building that Linus welded this incredible sculpture ten years ago into this facade. So not only was he doing it then, isn't it cool? You walk down the street and you go, "Hey, you see that piece of artwork over there? Yeah. I did that, and it's it'll be there." Until someone you know, uh, buys the building and tears it down. Well, until the developers come around and, and, and Linus has quite a few things to talk about. The developers and how they really uh, push the artists to the brink. The thing that I found interesting about the book, Tom, too, was the fact that during our interview, we didn't bring up much music. No, <laughs> we didn't. Well, I mean, it's going to be an incredible playlist, but right, the music, I, kind of crazy to talk about the music. I would just rather play it. And we didn't really get into the deep. There's so much. I mean, we could, we could do, we could do a radio show, a complete radio show on the Brooklyn scene and never, ever, ever run out of material. So exactly. That's what, and even mean. more importantly, never speak. listener would like that's i think our listener would appreciate if we became ai that's it <laughs> so let's get on with the shoe the really big show we're going to listen to part two of cisco bradley and linus Caraggio. take it away i could understand i get mm-hmm. what you're saying cisco in the sense that you'll probably see more micro scenes because Br- brooklyn attracted international attention when i had friends from the uk come over oh we got to go to brooklyn so brooklyn attracted yeah. that attention it was a very very big scene and i'm wondering also as reading the book this is really before i think think um, social media really had a grip on people's attention. People still congregated in public places and they wanted to hear live music. Live music is a part of everyone's social activity. They weren't sitting there on Tinder or Pinterest or, or Instagram and things like that, just taking selfies. Well, you were on Tinder. Well, I don't know about it, anyone yes. else, Tom. <laughs> I was on Timber. But, <laughs> you know, it was before people really became addicted to their iPhones. I mean, iPhones, what? iPhones so, really didn't take hold until like 2009, I guess, 2008 or, or yeah. thereabouts. It was more of an element of socializing. I think that's, I think it's a social decline. I don't know how yeah. else to describe it. I, yeah. I don't think you can really and, and then that's not to say that these other these devices don't enable us to do certain no, things. No, no, if you use good yeah, right. Maybe they do, but nothing really replaces face to face community. Right. Yeah. You know? right. And I think it became clear and during the pandemic I, I respected the valiant efforts that s- musicians were making to try to broadcast you know, sort of stream their performances online and all that. I hardly watched any of them. I just couldn't bear yeah. it. I just I couldn't do it. I felt like it would just make me feel even worse about not seeing live music. <laughs> you know, and I so you know, I, I love going to concerts in person. I don't think it and he, I always say, you know, if it's the choice is if I had twenty dollars to spend or something, and the choice was buy a buy a band's record or see them live once, I would go to see the live show every sure. time. So sure. being able to do that in person, I mean, there's there's no there's no replacement for it. To respond, I mean, to kind of add to what David was saying in terms of the tough place that we're in, I think we're all aware of like the sort of political crisis that we're in in this country, and there, there's some, a lot of really disturbing global politics happening. And one thing that I basically kind of argue for in the book is that we are in a state of cultural crisis in the United States because mm-hmm. we've sort of deprived our cultural institutions of support. I think this every time I, I look to see what movies are playing, that we're based in this sort of, oh, I feel like we're very caught, we're kind of caught in this this moment of kind of repetition. Yes, I mean, like, yes. how, can we remake a movie again rather than make a new movie? We like... Mm-hmm. Okay, we're going to remake like the color purple I just read earlier today is being remade. I mean, maybe it needs to be remade. I don't know, but you know, like like I feel like we're doing that over and over again. Like the well, whole it's commerce over. You you mentioned the forces of capital versus culture throughout the book. Well, yeah. if if the color purple <laughs> sold once, well, it'll sell again. You just put a new coat of right. paint, and it's it. easier to market that than to remarket right. a new thing. Yeah, but that doesn't help our cult. That doesn't help our artists. But again, really the cool. thing is, is I think that, people that get turn, right get turned on to new things, and like David and I do these improvisational. Uh, bass duets. Can you imagine mm-hmm. that, David? Two basses playing together. <laughs> we play in rooms up in Harlem and things. 
And the response is fabulous. People dig experimental music and they dig that. It's just that they're not introduced to it. You don't see it. You don't mm-hmm. see it on, mm-hmm. on in the mainstream media. Depending on what your algorithms are on YouTube, you might not be exposed to it. And that's what, again, getting back to the 1980s, the beauty of MTV was you'd sit there and you'd see five different genres of music back to back, just like in the olden days of FM and mm-hmm. AM radio. What are your thoughts on artificial intelligence now in the avant-garde community? I know people have been poo-pooing this. I got to tell you i'm due to my algorithms i don't know what it is i have a youtube uh premium subscription and i've been on the thread of this uh guy uh, nothing is real and he takes the beatles and he ai's them and he has paul mccartney singing goodbye yellow brick road he has john lennon singing verses with paul on a new paul mccartney song we have george harrison singing oasis songs i know david is fainting over this (laughs) and the thing is is that it sounds pretty good you know george does a pretty decent job on on wonderwall and I dig Paul McCartney doing the backing vocals on you know, Benny and the Jets. You see all the animation that's going on on YouTube and things where people are putting different characters in, in films. How do you think uh, AI will be embraced? Well, it certainly should be embraced by the avant-garde. I suspect that it's inevitable on some level. It's going to become a force in a way. Another tool, let's say. But another tool, I suppose. <laughs> I guess my question is why? <laughs> I don't know. I think. I, well, you know, I, I this, guess this, I... this is a this is a problem. I remember again <laughs> defending the eighties when when I was in ni- in nineteen seventy nine. I was at University of Miami, and this guy came in with this big keyboard that looked like a refrigerator with plugs hanging out of it, and it was a, it was a primitive sampler. This is the five years before the DX seven came out, which pretty much did strings and horns. And I remember my music teacher saying to me, "Oh, that no, that'll never replace horn players and string players." And then five years later. We're all sitting around mm-hmm. the DX7 doing uh, compositions, and now we can hear string arrangements. Now we can hear horn arrangements. We didn't have to go out and hire a horn right. section. So AI, obviously, in the right hands, can can produce amazing art, I think. I got to step in here. He's uh, always stepping on me. I'm and being too nice. I, I'm from the Midwest, so I'll, I'll let, I'll I, let I, David I got, talk. I've got two back. things that need to be... Uh, <laughs> first of all, the one thing about the avant-garde, and particularly the avant-garde in jazz, going back to my previous statement mm. about 19, 19- 60s and these guys can't play right we found out later on is not only could these guys play and they unfortunately had to do things like i i I look at um coltrane's ballads album as as a reason oh um no it's not that he does this he's he can do it the thing about the avant-garde is these people are playing so honestly yeah. This is exactly what they feel. What Linus paints, that beautiful painting over there, that is the reality. So to put, oh, I want to make, hey, yeah. Oh, how does this sound like as, um, Coltrane's saxophone or, 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 or something bizarre like that? What is the point? If AI was an instrument, I don't know. It's like <laughs> you, you look at Charles Gale. I would sit and chat with him and he'd pick up his horn and it was he was telling you something that was real. So to try and replicate that as AI, hey, remember last week, Tom, when I took um Can we Boogie remember back that from Stardust? Yes. And put it in chat GPT and said, in the style of ice tea. <laughs> yes. And then I did this, the lyrics in the style of Kanye. Yeah. Nothing about the Jews. There was, there was okay. fun. All right. Uh, <laughs> why? You're absolutely right, Cisco. There's, there's, there's no statement <laughs> necessary after why. What's the point? We've already lost so much of our creativity with synthesizers. Yeah. And well, you can you can. I, oh, I'm I'm, I'm 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 painting a broad stick. Don't don't worry. It's a it's a wide brush. <laughs> we no longer write songs. We write beats, and then we put the song on top. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. Some of these things sound great. I'm, I'm not knocking right. it. What I'm trying to say is that there's an honesty and and a and a purity to doing it yourself the first 
and only time it can be done. Remember, Eric Donfey said, once you blow it, it's there. It's gone. Yeah. You can't do it anymore. Yeah. So yeah, I would love to jump back in. I, I think I think in terms of why do I, why do I want to see art? Like why do I want to see art? Is it because I want to see particular colors arranged on a canvas in a particular way? Why do I want to see music? Is it because I want to see I want to hear particular sounds in a particular order or rhythms? I don't think it's just that. Maybe sound like okay, I like certain types of of music or I like certain types of art. I just am always utterly fascinated by the exercise of the human imagination. I mean, you mentioned Charles Gale, David. I just spoke with Charles Gale yesterday, by the way. I've been doing a series of interviews with him. I think Charles Gale is one of the most fascinating musicians of the past century. I, I think it's just his, what he what he was doing, it was just, it was done really, really well and it was just done super out in, in a way that I think people hadn't imagined before. I, I find that utterly fascinating. I don't think I would find it very fascinating if it had been per- produced by a computer because to me i think i'm more i I guess i'm I'm interested in seeing what the particular individuals what are particular individuals capable of and what do they bring out of themselves to what lengths do they go to actualize their visions for what it is that they want to to say or 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 make i guess my, my my other thought on ai is i just think why don't we focus on getting ai to do all the things we don't want to (laughs) <laughs> rather than the things that I think we all want to do. A truly liberated society, I suppose, most of the manual labor, I suppose, we, we could turn that over to robots and things so that we can all go and dance and make music and, I don't know, you know, do all the things that we love. Depends it doesn't on if mean, there's a profit in that, right? But I don't know. That, that's my yeah. other... Well, I, I think, you know, again, to me, I, AI, I, I remember people were hooting and hollering when, when um, what is it, Autotune came out and things. And, of course, Autotune used, was, was used first for just fixing human and performances and then it became a, a uh, entity unto right. itself and i mean we're all talking this is a generational thing if you have someone that grew up on it, ai then it's it's no big deal to them it's just another tool in the toolbox some things it can create on its own some things yes it's just replicating but aren't we all replicating things in a way i mean we do we are influenced by those that came before us when when david and i do our face duets we might groove on a, on a miles uh, bitches brew van where did miles get it from he got it from james brown where did james brown get it we're all it's ai different every time though yeah, that's that's the thing. Well, I, I, I guess I would say AI could, could do it if if AI could replicate it. It doesn't have to repeat itself. Why not AI? Why can't AI imp- improvise? Look, I'm not AI advocating here, but I mean, you know, the genie's out of the bottle, and technology doesn't move backwards. So, and it's definitely going to have an, an effect on musicians and whatever genre they're in. How do we get on to AI here? But uh, um, <laughs> I'm thinking two things. One, it's pretty scary, and two, that maybe I need an AI co-host here. Uh, <laughs> I would have someone that's more intelligent and has more hair than I do. <laughs> Linus, your thoughts? Uh, let's see. Um, you were talking about gentrification earlier, and the harbinger of gentrification for me was hearing screw guns within half a block. <laughs> And that meant the windows were out of the building and they were in the midst of putting new windows in and the walls were going up. That told me I had a a year or two at the most. And uh, you're talking about how you used to promote gigs. And back when I was running the gas station, we were booking things so quickly that we didn't even bother with wheat tasting and uh, ads in the village voice for the most part. We realized we weren't in control of how much the door made. So the point was just to get the fucking show on every every night and that made it not about money and uh you know if we made money that was kind of a thrill so the normal ways you run a business was not the way the gas station functioned at all and uh it still cracks me up that we we got away with that much autonomy over a almost 10 year period mm. on after being second street i love the gas station by the way it's like I, I i never got to go there but i've heard a lot of people talk about it so anyway thank yeah. you for that <laughs> Sure. It made your book, I guess, uh, and <laughs> passing. And uh, I have to say it was the epicenter of, of Ilbian with um, Greg Ash and DJ Spooky. That was definitely invented there. <laughs> and that vibe spread across the river to like keep refrigerated and rub you lad a bit. Both my friends were running those spaces. I was going to those shows. And uh, in your book, Greg says that going into um, the sensorium or keep refrigerated was like a no pressure club. And when I read that recently, 
I realized, yeah, that's exactly how I felt. There, there wasn't anybody putting pressure on you to buy drinks or now was the time to dance or come over <laughs> here and see the band because the spotlight went on. It was just kind of a fun house of uh, where you felt like gravitating. And that was such a different vibe from like the Palladium or Light or Kamikaze. Mm-hmm. Or, so what a breath of fresh air that whole time was. Time for it to happen again. And with saying that, Cisco, in terms of Bushwick, Tom and I were talking to Tim Byrne uh, about a week or so ago. He's doing things in the Gowanus. I mean, yeah. it's, it's it's morphing, it's, huh? It's going further and further out. Yeah, well, I mean, I, Bushwick inherited a lot of the remnants of, of Williamsburg. You know, a lot mm. of people moved over there. If they didn't leave the city, they probably moved to Bushwick. I moved to Bushwick in 2014 to try to be a part of that. But by like 2017 or 18, it was already moving into Ridgewood and mm. people were getting gentrified out. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty wild how oh, quickly. Well, I, I moved to Bushwick in 2000 in the back of the venue, Goodbye Blue Monday. I was, oh, studio. Oh, okay. I live a couple blocks from there. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I got gentrified out of Bushwick in 2010. When I got there in 2000, interestingly, there was one four story industrial building that had been turned into condos. It's like this um, young white woman getting into a private car. I was like, wow, that's already here. <laughs> but it wasn't anything like that within 10 blocks. And uh, there were some Puerto Rican women saying, hey, blondie, or whatever. <laughs> I was like, okay, the neighborhood's going to win for a while. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I always feel like Broadway kind of kept the, the neighborhood honest a little bit because of the above, above ground subway. And there's just like certain things they couldn't change that kind of kept it a little bit grittier than other parts of North Brooklyn. But yeah, yeah I don't know. I mean, I think that, you know, I mean, the, the neighbors are changing more rapidly and the developers now they know the drill. So, mm. you know, like they're getting to neighborhoods before artists now. I think, you know, they, they know where, okay, what's the next place that people are going to go? They don't, you know, they just go there and start, you know, developing. I mean, I think of like where I lived about 20, maybe 16, all of a sudden I noticed every block had at least one building under construction, sometimes two or three. Where I lived on the block I lived, developers went and they bought about half of the block on the other side destroyed all the buildings and put in a big building. I mean, it, yeah. that and that became that, you know, that was just happening all over Bushwick. So, I mean, artists have been, there's sort of two wings of the of the Brooklyn community, I would say. You know, there's like the North Brooklyn thing that's moved into Ridgewood. I don't know where it goes Queens, after that. Queens, right? The, the end of the train line. That's Queens, Ridgewood, right? Yeah, Ridgewood, Queens. So I guess it's not even in Brooklyn anymore. Yeah, and then you have that, the, that's that TVI place, right? Yeah, I'm yeah. Much. There. And then, you know, and then there's like the South Brooklyn thing. Tim Byrne being a major figure down, you know, there. Right. And it was in Park Slope and then it moved to sort of South Slope and Kensington and Ditmas. And I guess there's, you know, people, li- a lot of people living over in uh, like Sunset Park. I have friends that just moved to Bay Ridge, <laughs> you know. So wow. people are moving further and further out. And it's that, you know, like that's where people are kind of doing their thing. There's a lot of stuff in Sunset Park now. I feel like there are shows there. I go to them less because it's hard, for, you know, it's like just harder to get there. But I, I don't know, whatever. It just people find ways to innovate. And, you know, I'm always amazed at people finding ways to make it work. But is it sustainable? I don't know. Staten Island's <laughs> the next place, right? <laughs> what's, what's that? Staten Island's <laughs> the next place. We'll have, instead of Dumbo, it'll be Vumbo on, underneath the Verrazano. Well, I was always, I lived in, in the Bronx uh, for many years, and I was surprised that. That Williamsburg gentrified before the Bronx because the Bronx is better transportation. Uh, the one, two, three trains, the four, five, six trains. Yeah, the train of the access in the Bronx is really great. Right. Better so you Queens. have that, you have the infrastructure there, the old pre war buildings there. You go to the South Bronx. And I was thought, well, gosh, everybody lives in close proximity. You have a lot of low income places. How did Williamsburg make it? And I guess, again, you, as you mentioned, the L train is a lot more convenient than, than one going. stop. One stop. Well, it's one stop away. And I think because of, the, of all the post-industrial space, once the developers hit it, they could just clear out. And they, right. went, you know, they were just taking out entire blocks. I mean, crazy, those big towers that are there, I think, what, around North 6th? Seventh Street or wherever that is, you know, right. the big towers. Yeah, you know, that's where the that's that's where my book basically begins, you know, with people <laughs> you know, people doing all that stuff along the waterfront. Right. I mean it's wild. It's really wild and and really tragic to see how much it's 
you know, how, how rapidly it changed. I mean, if you think of, you know, think of other like major art movements that have happened in various places and to think of, you know, sometimes things lasted decades, but here, you know, we had maybe a decade. Yeah, yeah exactly. that section, that section by the park where those tall buildings are, you could just walk right up to the waterfront. And I remember just being out at night on my motorcycle and seeing like a burning fire near the water and hearing the faint sound of music and riding up through the over abandoned cars and and concrete blocks and dirt and puddles and seeing uh, like the whole scene just like um, coming along happening upon a tribe back in pro magnum times and <laughs> people would be raging you know and no cops would be around and this would just be like going on on and out on like uh, you know, north 11th street <laughs> And uh, then it's funny to see the park that they build after the Domino Sugar Factory get finished, which looks like um, an airport uh, runway. It's so orderly. And I think there's circles painted on the ground where people are supposed to socially distance from the next group of people in a circle. You know? <laughs> like, um, One of the questions that Tom and I always ask is with the remote control lifestyles that we have, where are people moving to? They're certainly not moving to the office buildings in New York that are fairly vacant. They're not right. moving. Mm-hmm. Talking about the Bronx, you, you go on the uh, the Deegan out of the city, there's condo construction all over the place. Yeah. Who's going to live there? That's the the question that there's no one here. They're all leaving. None of it's making any but, sense. But with with the artists gone, the right? speculation. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of these, as David and I were were thinking, that a lot of them are pre-COVID contracts. But if the artists leave, what's the appeal of New York? Why? I mean, you're going to be here for what? Happy hours and tapas bars. I mean, why would you want to spend a million dollars on a New York apartment and there's nothing here? There's no clubs. There's no music. There's no art galleries. There's no Greenwich Village art fair like there was. What would you? Do? Yeah. What do you do here? <laughs> You'd be surprised by how banal people can be <laughs> and happy with their thousand dollar bottle service. And I guess some bullshit club. Yeah, I agree with Linus. There's a chunk of people who look at New York as purely just kind of for investment purposes. Yeah, you know, like they want to buy a piece of real estate that's going to accrue value. So there's like that aspect. Um, there's a certain I don't know sort of so called high society that they want to be a part of. That you know everything costs ten times as much as it does everywhere else, but it somehow gets them in some elite circle i don't know i don't see the appeal of that like (laughs) the thing that made new york great was has always been its artists i mean otherwise otherwise it can be kind of you know it can be during the pandemic i did leave the city for a period and i realized it's like i love nature i'd forgotten i'd been in new york for so long i would actually prefer it if if these people would leave but i think the people that can't leave now are the people who have invested in the real estate right. in this big boom because they need it to they need it to continue because they put all their money in the in that one basket. They're not the ones that make New York interesting or worth living in, you know? <laughs> Maybe ahead, Mayor sorry. Adams will um, designate Times Square areas like the new AI uh, mall where you can get that bohemian artist experience served <laughs> up by a robot. AI <laughs> AI, right? <laughs> Mayor Ben Vereen. <laughs> <laughs> AI Bastiat. Uh, uh, Cisco, what has been the reaction to the book? Uh, what what has been the feedback you've been getting? Yeah, I've seen there have been a few book burnings. No, no, I'm joking. <laughs> um, uh, it's been good. Uh, <laughs> it's been really great. Of course, I'm sure there are people out there that don't like the book or I didn't write about them, so they're mad at me or whatever. Mm. But and I should say, I've had this, this, I might as well say this here publicly. I've had really this <laughs> guilty feeling because I, I set out to write a book about the whole Brooklyn music scene kind yeah, of a, it's a, it's a monumental task. I mean, come on. Yeah. And what I realized at some point, the first of all, the publisher said, you can have, I think it was 130,000 words or something like that. And I thought, well, so I handed him a, ha- a manuscript of 135,000 words. <laughs> so I guess just to say, you know, there's the whole South Brooklyn thing that I've wanted to write about and, mm. and, and hope to have the opportunity at some point in the future to, to do that. And I've done quite a bit of research and interviews for that. I mean, I've been working on some other projects too. I don't know. I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the reactions have been pretty good. I think the, it's, it's always, it's a difficult thing to write about. When I first started the book, I was interviewing people. I'm a professional, they're a professional, or whatever you want to call it. Well, the, 10 years later, I'm friends with a lot of people. So it's, mm. it is, it was very nerve wracking putting this book out into the public, <laughs> knowing that I, I'm, I don't know, maybe a few of my, you know, it's like, it's, people can be very sensitive about how they're portrayed and do that right in every case. There's all that. But I, I, I feel like it's been generally, the reception's been amazing, to be honest. I've gotten, the, you know, there been a number of reviews and all that, which is great. It's always nice when, like, like I think, you, know, you, the two of you reached out to me. There have been a few 
few other instances of that. So it's always nice when I don't have to create all of my own press, you know. <laughs> so that, that's been wonderful. And I always like that's a good sign that, that people are appreciating the, the book. A book tour coming up starting June 11th, kind of throughout the summer, kind of scattered dates right, through the David, summer. All right, David, we have to plug the book tour. It starts, where does it start in, in June 11th? It's in Brooklyn, uh, Unnameable Books. We'll be doing an event there on June 11th. I'm trying to include music on every bill. So that's mm. been part of what I've been doing with the book tour. So I have and what's the new book? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Are you so, getting, you're getting all the people you forgot on this one? <laughs> yeah, so anyway, I'll send you this info about the dates of the book tour. So I, good, I don't good. know the same. Is it all in yeah. New York State or are you going around the country? I have, I have two in New York City. So Brooklyn on the 11th at Unnameable Books and then at Village Works on the 23rd of June. Okay. Um, you know, on oh, St. I'm going to have a show at Village Works. I'll be oh, having cool. a show at Village Works. Too. Oh, plug oh, your sure. show. Plug your show, Linus. When, when does your show start? Sometime this summer. We haven't finalized, but it'll be with Al. Yeah, and uh, oh, cool. Chambers, other street artists. Oh, excellent. Uh, I'll come check that out, too. But yeah, um, so I have some upstate events, a few different places in Beacon and Catskill and Andy's, oh, New York, okay. a few different places. And then I'm doing uh, one in D.C. in July and Richmond, Virginia and Durham, North Carolina. So I'm doing a little run down that way. And I'll right. do something in Boston in August, Kingston, New York in September. So anyway, just a range of a bunch of things. So I'll send you all the details. But you asked, David, you asked me about the next book. I, I, I don't know how much I can say right now, but I have a couple of things in the works. How much can I say public right now? So I, I say stuff that's on Facebook. Facebook. Our, 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 page five hundred and sixty-seven. So come on, our our, <laughs> our listener, our listener won't tell you. <laughs> okay, so a book that's very far along the way that I've been working on is is uh, a book about the roots of free jazz uh, that came out of Cleveland, Detroit, and Buffalo. Oh, okay. So I'm specifically looking at figures like Albert Eiler coming out of Cleveland and Charles oh, Tyler okay. and Frank Wright and Bobby Few who all came there and from there and some Detroit guys, Charles Moore, the trumpet player, Van Grio Galaxy, the, the tribe label that was there in the 70s. I'm, I'm writing about all of those guys and Charles Gale from Buffalo. So I, right. I've been doing some extensive interviews with a lot of people there. I've worked really closely. You know John Sinclair, the the poet? Yeah. He sort of famous. I mean, he was a poet also. He's probably more famous for being a Amer- kind of like a pro pot activist. In right. Yeah. John Sinclair. 60s, he was arrested. He was put in prison for two joints. He got 10 years in prison. Right. John Lennon. Uh, John did, Lennon yeah. wrote a song about him. Right. <laughs> anyway, yeah. he, he was at the center of a lot. Of, he, he's not a free jazz guy, but he, he was at the center of a community and he wrote a lot about and kept a lot of records. I've been working with his archive. So anyway, I, that's that's the book that I'm kind of most furthest along with. I do have a lot of material on, on other parts of the Brooklyn scene, and I've been thinking of at some point turning to that. I think I needed to take, it's like one of those things where you work on something really closely. I felt like I needed to kind of just take us do something in another direction for a little while. So that free jazz book is is moving along. I'm, you know, I have, I'm probably about three quarters of the way through writing that. And I guess I might as well just say the other book that I'm, that I have on the horizon that I've been working on is writing a biography of Charles Gale. Hmm. And it's been, he's a singular individual and a really interesting person, incredible uh, musician. I've been working on that as well, um, working with, with him and working with some others uh, that were, yeah, that played a lot with him. So that's in the works. And, I, you know, I have a few other things that I'm just sort of thinking about, but I'm excited to be moving forward with these other projects. I mean, I, you know, for me, the pandemic, I ended up just kind of withdrawing from everything. I didn't have any social life or anything. <laughs> anything to distract me from anything so yeah i ended up just writing a lot and i started to get these projects going i think around 20 20 20 21 something like that so um so yeah i mean those those are those are moving forward um cool cool but they're yeah. You might want to talk to my wife because about 25 years ago, she did a, a screenplay that we had been in talks with Charles to play one of the lead characters. Oh, wow. It's funny that you say uh, that, he, that you were considered for a lead part. And this, is this for an acting? Uh, for a- Yeah, she, she wrote a story that called them There by the Grace. It was about a, um, a high school band that um, lost their music teacher who went to a, um, a high class private school and uh, there would be a battle of the bands and one of the kids would go by this homeless guy hmm. who was always hmm. practicing. You know, we were in talks with Charles for that for a while. Unfortunately, she didn't get the funding, so it's sitting on the shelf somewhere. That's when I used to go to the Knitting Factory all the time and watch uh, Charles do you know, things like Kingdom Come and right. and, and things like that. And uh, Wow. The name of one of my father's pieces. 
<laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, well, well, Charles, you know, uh, when his career kind of took off in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, you know, like, and he started touring in Europe, I've heard this story from a whole bunch of different people. He would commonly be mistaken for Sidney Poitier. Like, he would show up at the hotel where he was, you know, stay for the night, or, you know, after the gig or whatever, and people, they would, oh, Mr. Poitier, and they would, like, roll out the red carpet for him, and I, I think at first <laughs> Not necessarily surprised. a bad thing, right? <laughs> Supposedly, after, like, after it happened a couple of times, he just started to roll with it. <laughs> you know, why why wouldn't you? Yeah. Speaking of mm-hmm. underrated black musicians, uh, I was interested <laughs> to hear Butch Morris taking up some space in your book, and yeah. he was at Ars Electronica Festival in 1986 with... Um, the Rivington School and Arlene Schloss, who had a salon, which featured a lot of uh, early acts, including uh, Basquiat's band Gray. And uh, Butch performed there a few times, and he came to ours with uh, a, a couple of young, nicely dressed uh, white musicians from Manhattan, and uh, they played their music. And that's when I first met Butch in uh in Austria at um, a castle outside of Linz where they put us up, which uh, the Nazis had occupied during World War II. So I, I could tell Butch had a, had a very, you know, very serious uh, agenda for the next 40 or 50 decades or four or five decades. Four or five, I would say. Yeah, yeah. So, um, hmm. yeah, it was, it was, it was cool. I, I didn't really realize he was part of the Williamsburg scene to that degree, so I learned something from the book. Well, it was definitely that that moment where Zebulon kind of brought Manhattan out to Brooklyn, which I, I thought was kind of an interesting moment to bring in more established artists too, I think. And Zebulon was an interesting place. I mean, you had, whether it was Charles Gale or Billy Bang or Butch Morris or, or uh, Jonas Meckes playing, you know, like going out there and performing poetry or doing film stuff. Where you know, was so Zebulon? Where, where was it? Grand Street, I think, okay. right? So I forget exactly the mm-hmm. address, but you know, I look at part of my other part, the other part of my life is I'm an archivist in a way. You know, I mean, just to do the work that I'm doing as a historian I, I do a lot of archiving and i would say our, our archives for 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 cultural for american you know kind of cultural output is is that is an inadequate as it is but for black artists a lot of times major black artists have their work not preserved at all mm. or, or very or very little of it and somebody like i mean i just have to say i mean you know someone who's who's something like free jazz which i would say is sort of a marginalized art form in the way that the jazz establishment has reacted to it makes you know this wave of, of artists that came through in the 60s and 70s they, they haven't come anywhere close to getting i think kind of proper support and even now when the generation first generation of free jazz is basically gone now um, mm. with cecil taylor passing away a few years ago i mean like that People still haven't woken up to Cecil Taylor, and it's 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 2023 it's in a way. He'd be 94 if he was alive today. Uh, so I mean, it, he started his work I think in 1955, and it's like you know, people still haven't kind of. And I think when that means the archives aren't being maintained well enough. Despite the, the efforts of many people, I mean, it just there just needs to be more funding. There needs to be all of that. So, you know, something I harp on in, about in the book a little bit about you know supporting artists actively. I think there's the, the other side of that, of course, is yeah. is figuring out how yeah. to how to preserve legacies of people. And we're talking about major American artists. I mean, I yeah. I don't care if other people think oh you know Cecil was playing out, therefore he's not really jazz. What are all that nonsense? To me, these are the most interesting artists by far. I mean, I think Cecil Absolutely. Taylor was one of them. Cecil what, Taylor was, what Tom and I have done is we 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 call this the Wintonization <laughs> of yeah. jazz. Right. Unless you're uh, essentially a young black man in a suit playing old Art Blakey style right. music, it doesn't. <laughs> just, well, we and we, with Ken Burns for God's sake. That was a hard. It's thing. almost yeah. as if that entire form of music yeah. was eliminated. From the, the jazz PBS thing, it's, it's that's absurd. basically what happened, and that's the, 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 the he created the sort of canon and what jazz is, and in the mind of the general public, and erased this huge wave of artists. I mean, Cecil Taylor to me is is an absolute giant, and I don't think we've really as a society done anything to really embrace what he did or, or try to understand it in any of it. I mean, then you go down the list there. I mean, if, if he's not getting the due, then Charles Gale's definitely not getting the due. You know what Absolutely. I mean? So I, I, I um, listen to Cecil Taylor. I, I like that frenetic, intense stuff. And yeah, yeah me too. He's it, been marginalized the, the same way Rivington School is marginalized. Mm-hmm. It was... Uh, below Houston Street, it happened. We've had our experiences dealing with the jazz police, the bass police. You know, it's whenever somebody does something interesting, the establishment reacts and they uh, they shut it, they try to shut it down, which only makes it more popular. <laughs> yeah. You know. 
I think there, there needs to be a lot more. I don't know. Funding is one thing, but you know, just uh, public attention. You know, to- yeah. avant garde music needs a David Lee Roth. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Well, it, gotta, it, you, well it, this is well, it this needs is, that one guy that's just gonna. I think in terms know. of archiving now, at least in the present tense, I mean, with platforms like YouTube, and we're all filmmakers now because of these things. That a lot of things that would not, if this platform was available back then, could have documented all this great stuff. I mean, I just love watching jazz from the sixties and seventies, watching Frank Zappa performances in Europe, which we never mm-hmm. saw here, other than I think he was on the Mike Douglas show in nineteen seventy. Seventy-three uh, to promote uh, what was it apostrophe or, or overnight sensation, right? right. Um, but he was never other than that in Saturday Night Live. I mean, that's the only two times I think Frank Zappa was actually on commercial television. No, he was on the Steve Allen show oh, back was he? in okay. nineteen. Well, when he was a teenager, playing yeah. bicycle spokes, right? Okay, on a bicycle. <laughs> Steve, we not only have the prettiest girls in the audience here at the Steve Allen Show, but also you'll have to admit some of the strangest musical instruments. (laughs) And this gentleman plays perhaps the strangest of them all. He plays the bicycle, and his name is Frank Zappa. Thank you. You actually play a bicycle? Are you in the Musicians Union? Uh, no. Do you play any other musical instrument, anything more conventional, perhaps? Guitar, vibes, bass, and drums. Guitar, vibes, bass, drums, and bicycle. (laughs) (laughs) This bicycle will travel from his bass to his drums to his guitar. Uh, How did you happen to uh, pick up your first bicycle? I I was discussing this before with uh, some of the people backstage. I believe that a lot of the people have actually played bicycles from time to time. When they're young, they take a piece of cardboard and a clothespin and attach it to the uh, rear wheel and when it goes around it makes that noise and you're playing a bicycle then. Oh, I see. You mean when they pretend they have a little motor and make it sound like a motorbike. Yes, we've all done that. Well, is that what you do? You make a motorbike noise? I see a couple of bikes over here. Perhaps we'd better go over and demonstrate and show them what you do. Frank Zappa, Z-A-P-P-A, huh? Well, here we are, friends. Stereo bikes. the sounds that you can do. Yes. Oh, you have a microphone down there, I see. So that is the benefit of YouTube, and many of the artists we spoke to that are not in the mainstream, Larry Grenadier, Michael Manring, who David wrote a wonderful book about alternative bass tuning. Pass, try and pass that one past the bass, please, right, David? Alternative bass uh, tuning. I think we've sold nine copies. Okay. And my mom's, you know, got to buy some more now. <laughs> so through digital media, through platforms like YouTube and Vimeo, we can we can start to document these things a little bit more accurately. Well, in some ways, I think those, those have been fantastic. I mean, yeah, YouTube has incredible archive on like the Brooklyn music scene, for yes. example. And, yeah, it's definitely different as I'm looking in earlier time periods. I mean, oh. it, it, we're talking about Charles Gale. I mean, I, he's an incredible artist. And, you know, he basically emerges in 1987 at the Knitting Factory. That's where he kind of got his big, whatever, you know, sort of platform. You know, we're basically missing the first 25 years of his artistic development. There's, there's right. before 1988, the record that he put out in 1988 titled Homeless. Before that, he never recorded in the studio. But he'd been playing since about 1962. And up in, in Buffalo, there's one living room recording from 1965. Yeah, I think you mentioned that in the book. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And other than that, there's literally nothing between 65 and 88. I have looked and looked and looked. <laughs> and yeah, so I mean, archive. The landscape has changed, thankfully, I think for the better. I mean, yeah. maybe we, I think we over document now in a way. So sometimes it's hard to like find the gems that are there right. so much, but. I'd rather have too much than, than yes. not enough. I think uh, Sev Feldman would be somebody you should connect. Resonance is the name of the record label, and he's been doing some very interesting things. Some some early recordings, of Bill Evans with Scott LaFaro and things like mm-hmm. that. But he lovingly takes things that you're not really, yeah, they're, they're, they're not going to be big money makers, but he he's compelled do that. That's somebody you might want to try and find, connect with. Yeah. Well, one of the good things about this show is the yes, fact David. that you know we've been on for an hour and a half. Now, what does that mean? That means that I can cut the show in half, <laughs> do part one one week, and have over an hour's worth of music from that particular uh, books period, and then do a volume two where we can have even more music. So this has been great. 
This has been great. Well, thanks for having us, Linus and Cisco. And of course, David, the book is Williamsburg Avant-Garde Experimental Music and Sound on the Brooklyn Waterfront. And it's out on Duke University Press, right? In digital or hard copy. Those of you who like to That's actually great. see yeah. the book in public, you can get the hard copy. All right, well, guys. It's been an absolute pleasure and an honor to be here. All right. Linus, it's absolutely, it's wonderful to meet you. And thank you, yeah. Tom and David. There's Linus with his shades on, cool shades. And, and, uh, yeah, we'll try to get out to your lectures, uh, Cisco. Signings. All right. Maybe the 23rd. Do they serve yeah, wine? Yeah, I'll send you the we'll, we'll Yeah, do. <laughs> milk milk and cookies or something. All right, guys, take care. Thanks for being on the show. We'll let you know when it airs. We'll get you links to the podcast. And, Cisco, you'll be selling millions of books in, in no time, I yeah, promise. Thanks. All right. <laughs> Very care, good guys. to see you guys. Take care.